It's really great to see everyone coming back. I know some of us are sad that summer is over, but uh, it real feels like a buzz in the city again, and uh, schools are back, universities are back, colleges are back, and we're all back in action. And so, um, anyone watched some tennis yesterday? Oh, yeah. That was exciting. So I might be a little bit hoarse. I was shouting at the TV, especially in that second set when I thought she was going to lose it. Uh, but we're excited. We, we the North, not she the North. And so, awesome. All right, we're going to jump in. We're going to start our four-week series through September. And uh, it's, it's called Faith and. Now, versus, versus means to be against something, to oppose something. And uh, what we wanted to do with the idea behind this series was to really touch on some things that oftentimes are objections to, to people putting faith in, in Jesus or objections to faith uh, in general. And, uh, and so we're not exhaustively going to explore all those objections, but we're going to take a few that are kind of uh, more common ones. And it's kind of like oil and water. Like these things should not exist. They, these things are opposed and anti, like oil and water. It's like, and if they do exist, it's kind of awkward. It's a little... And so sometimes people say, you have faith, you have no doubts. So we're going to look next week at faith and science. That's always put against each other. Is that actually true? Does, does our faith actually exclude all scientific and rational thought? And faith and suffering, we have a guest speaker for that Sunday. That's going to be a real important one. Suffering is a, is a massive question people wrestle with. How do we make that compatible with faith in a good and sovereign God? And then lastly, we're going to touch on something that um, hopefully will materialize into a series. Um, faith and sexuality, what does faith have anything to do with um, us and how God's wired us as male and female. And so today we're going to do faith and doubt. Kind of a tongue-in-cheek way of maybe titling this message would be to say, I believe in doubt. And so uh, we're going to look at doubt. Um, doubt is often misunderstood, especially in the Christian church, especially in Christian faith, especially in evangelical charismatic churches of which our church would probably be labeled. Uh, this week, I just just to paint a backdrop of, of our, kind of our cultural moment, um, you know, there was a, a, a chicken food chain that was established and, and launched in our city um, this past uh, Friday. And uh, I don't want to get into the politics of whether you enjoy a chicken sandwich from this particular establishment or not, but uh, when I was watching the news and seeing all the different things and there's lines out the door and protesters and I thought like isn't this a picture of just our world right now really a picture of North America and very much a picture of Toronto is that we live in a society in a culture that is a marketplace of ideas beliefs and practices and sometimes those are in opposition to one another and clash and we have to work out how to tolerate other people's views that might be very different or even very anti to what our view is Canada prides itself on that. It's known as a very tolerant nation. We want to make room for all diversities of beliefs, practices, um, and ideas. Uh, and so we, we're in a culture that encourages people to challenge and question everything. Uh, and some of that is good and some of that is not so good, but we're encouraging people to have a healthy skepticism about almost everything. Um, coming into the church world, particularly the evangelical world, in the last few years there's been some very high-profile Christian leaders that have gone on their own public questioning, their own public of, do I really believe this anymore? And uh, you know, one name that comes to mind, um, Rob Bell, if many of you remember him, um, he actually studied at the same university that I'm studying, doing a master at Wheaton, he's a graduate of Wheaton, and so we had some good conversations with some of the professors that taught him when I was in Wheaton over the summer. Um, uh, very recently, uh, if these names mean nothing to you, don't worry, but in the, in the Christian evangelical world, I mean um, Joshua Harris, who was a, a young man at 21 and wrote a bestseller called I Kissed Dating Goodbye and, and recently he's in Vancouver now and recently has come out, he's separated, divorced from his wife and has actually gone in the process of deconverting, no longer believes, rejects the Christianity that he grew up with. Um, Marty Sampson would be a new one, like someone who's publicly wrestling with these kind of questions and so I think it's very important for us, particularly for this church, as we try to engage uh, young people, the university is right next door to us. Um, and people have questions, and we want to be well equipped and well able to understand what role does doubt play in uh, growing a healthy faith. And so join me, if you will, uh, in John chapter 20, uh, 24 to 29. We're going to look at doubt, Thomas and Jesus, and uh, we're going to look at this little uh, interaction. And, and off that, I want to talk about some uh, misconceptions or ideas about doubt, or perhaps maybe a way for us to rethink doubt and then see what application we would have going forward from this. John chapter 20, 
It says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples, Jesus' disciples, were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, uh, just to understand the context, this is just after Jesus' resurrection. And so the uh, initial uh, disciples, about 11 of them, gather in this room. But Thomas is not there. And so, have you ever been to one of those small group meetings? Well, have you never not been to a small group meeting and then you catch up with the people in the small group? How was the small group? And they're like, it was unbelievably life-changing. It's like the times that you miss out on something, everything happens. And this for Thomas was, I don't know what he was doing, maybe he was catching up on Netflix or something like that. I don't know. But he missed a really important moment. The resurrected Jesus shows up to the other disciples. And so Thomas misses out. And they're telling him, Thomas, we saw the, our resurrected Lord. I mean, Thomas is a guy who's been with the disciples. He's hung out with Jesus for the last three plus years. And, uh, and he says, no, I, I've got to see this with my own eyes. I've got to touch him with my own hands in order for me to believe. I refuse to believe unless I see that. And so obviously, the following week, eight days later, Thomas finds himself in the small group meeting, thankfully, and Jesus shows up. And then as we read, you see what happens. So little is, uh, little do we know about Thomas other than this interaction. There's one or two other instances in, uh, in the gospel where we hear about him. But I think he gets a bad rap because even if you're not in the Christian faith, have you ever heard the phrase, oh, that's a doubting Thomas? And we get that phrase in someone who just doesn't, doubts, doesn't believe. And it comes from this. But the Bible never calls him doubting Thomas. But Christian tradition, we kind of put that label on him. And I personally think he gets a bad rap. I think it's a little unfair. And here's why. I'm going to get a little uh, technical with you. But it's important that I get technical with you. Because in the original language, the word that Jesus uses to uh, kind of rebuke Thomas in a very gracious and merciful way, but kind of says, Thomas, don't disbelieve. It's not the word that's used for doubt in other places. In, in other words, Jesus is not saying, Thomas, stop doubting. He says, Thomas, stop being unwilling to believe. And so this word disbelieve, it means in the Greek, apistis. And apistis is faith. A means non-faith. It's literally the opposite of faith. Belief, it's unbelief. Jesus is saying, stop being an unbeliever and believe. But the word doubt is used differently, and it means to be uncertain, to be hesitant. To waver a little bit. For example, when Jesus walks on water and calls Peter out, Peter walks in the water and all of a sudden he starts looking around and realizes where he is and he sees the storm. He starts sinking. Jesus reaches out his hand to him, pulls him up and says something like, Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Why did you get uncertain? Why did you waver? Why did you hesitate? Another place in Matthew 28, Jesus appears to his disciples. He's about to give them the Great Commission. We all know this. Amazing. These men of faith are coming together. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. If you're a Christian here, and you've ever had doubts, you're in very good company. They're literally worshipping Jesus, but some of them are doubting. And so I think we need to rethink doubt in a way that the Bible puts it forward to us. It's not necessarily bad or sinful. Jesus rebukes Thomas, not because he's a doubter in that moment, because he has an unwillingness to believe the other disciples' testimony. Now, there's something else going on here. Thomas and those disciples will go on to be called apostles. And to be an apostle in the first century, you had to have re witnessed the resurrected Jesus. That was one of the qualifications to be an apostle. So this is a big deal. So Jesus is in some way being quite merciful to get Thomas back on track with his calling. Because if Thomas doesn't witness the resurrected Jesus, his apostleship is going to be called into question. And the apostles were important because they established the church. They had an authority to establish because why? They had been with the resurrected Jesus. That's why Paul, later on in his conversion, the resurrected Jesus appears to him in a dramatic encounter. And therefore, 
that he becomes an apostle to. And so Jesus is almost helping him get him back on track, but he's rebuking him, says, but as an apostle you need to see this, but as a believer, as a disciple, you should have just believed your brothers. You should have just believed your brothers. You should have had an unwillingness. And so I think, instead of doubting Thomas, we should have called him the incredulous Thomas. Incredu incre incredulity is a hard word to pronounce. Incredulity, it literally means an unwillingness to believe. But it's not as catchy. But there is a famous painting called The Incredulity of St. Thomas. And so uh, I think it's better when we think about Thomas that he's not so much a doubt as he had an unwillingness and Jesus is rebuking an unbelief, which can be very fatal to any of us. So with this in mind, I want to look at three things I think particularly that help us as we look and re-look and rethink uh, doubt. Firstly, doubt is not the same as unbelief. Doubt is not the same as unbelief. And so if doubt is not the same as unbelief, then it's not the opposite of faith. And it's so it finds itself in between faith and unbelief. I love uh, this quote by Os Guinness, who's written some really helpful things. If you uh, want to go uh, reference, go search some of his books on this whole thing about faith and doubt. But this, he puts it like this, to believe is to be in one mind about accepting something as true. To disbelieve is to be in one mind about rejecting. I refuse to believe unless I see Jesus myself. That was Thomas. And to doubt is to kind of be in between, to waver somewhere in between the two, and thus to be in two minds. This important distinction uncovers a major misconception of doubt. The idea that a believer betrays faith and surrenders to unbelief by doubting. We're going to establish on, on, onwards that if you're a Christian and you've never had serious doubts about your faith, that's not a good place to be in. If we're banking your very life on that, on the faith that you believe, you should poke at it a bit, you should question it a bit, and see the strength and the integrity of it uh, in order to be able to convincingly stand upon that in this life and the next. And so this misconception that doubt is sinful, doubt is bad, has caused tremendous damage to a lot of people in the church who have sincerely questioned their faith at one time or another. And so we don't want that to be the case. Uh, and that double-mindedness, that wavering, it really sums up the wrestle that faces those who doubt. They have a divided heart. And so doubt, you don't want to stay in a place of doubt for sure, but it isn't the same as an unbelieving heart. So secondly, doubt is neither trivial nor terminal. And so it's, an, it's a serious thing. We don't treat it, we, we don't glamorize doubt. And so part of the tricky thing that I need to do today is not glamorize doubt, although I think in our neck of the Christian faith, of the evangelical faith, I'm kind of pushing a little bit more to that side because I think we've had a very negative view of doubt and we've kind of shamed people who have doubts and I want to kind of flip the balance here. But we don't glamorize doubt, but we also sort of demonize doubt either. Scripture doesn't do that. We shouldn't do it either. We don't want to be too soft on doubt and get too liberal and that quickly helps people go into a state of unbelief. We don't want to be too strict on doubt, be too conservative. That crushes people who are struggling with sincere doubts about their faith at one stage or time or another. God, it would seem, seems to be a lot more tolerant with people who doubt than the church and Christians. Scripture is filled with great men and women of faith who doubted. Abraham and Sarah doubted the promises of God. Moses and Gideon doubted the call of God upon their lives. Um, look, think about uh, Job. Think we have a whole book dedicated to this guy's wrestling with the goodness of God. The question of suffering. Why me? Why, good, why do good things happen? I mean, why do bad things happen to good people? And so scripture paints a picture of these great men and women of faith. But they wrestled with God in their doubts. And so thirdly, doubt is then necessary for a robust faith. If we want a vibrant, growing faith, we're going to need to have a good dose of doubt in it. Um, it's been often used as the analogy of, of your body. A, a healthy body has antibodies in it. Or sometimes in the immunization, what they'll do is they'll give you a small dose of the virus in order to help your body build up antibodies against that virus. This is, in a sense, what doubt can do for our faith. It helps us to build up a robustness in our faith, especially then in times where crises happen or when things come against us that we don't crumble because we've never really poked and prodded at our faith and tested it in times of still, still in quiet and peace and, and when we can have some clarity of thought. Uh, Phil Yancey 
puts it like this. It says, doubt always coexists with faith. For in the presence of certainty, who would need faith at all? So it's always going to have a, a, an element of coexisting because we don't have certainty about everything that we want to have certainty about. And so despite the prevalence and the seeming helpfulness of doubt in our spiritual walks and vitality, uh, we really talk about it, we acknowledge it, right? And if we do, sometimes we kind of shame it. Uh, it's viewed negatively. You shouldn't doubt. Don't you know what the Bible says? Just believe the Bible. You can't question that. And so we downplay its role in our journey. We downplay its role in potentially helping us become more strengthened and healthy with those antibodies as we encounter uh, questions either personally or even questions our culture asks about our faith. I, I wanted to put up a, uh, a, a diagram that I, I, I hope is a little bit helpful. Uh, and so this cycle of how uh, doubt helps us with a robust faith. So typically what happens is an event will happen. It could be a crisis. You know, all of a sudden the, the suffering of a loved one forces you to begin. It could be something positive. You could get a, a, a start a relationship with someone. Uh, it doesn't matter. It just something catalyzes a moment of you being to question. And you have questions, and then you begin to doubt. You're, in, you're uncertain. Uh, I believe God's sovereign, I believe God's good, but this doesn't feel good. This doesn't look like God's in control. So you're uncertain about how to reconcile that. And then it can lead you onto a path of what's called deconstructing. What does it mean to deconstruct? It simply means you take apart a belief system. You take apart the different parts to make it up, to look at it critically, to analyze it, to see where the, the weakness is in what you perhaps believe. This is very often what happens for um, a lot of kids that were grown up in Christian homes, and maybe they get to an age of teenager, or maybe they go off to university, and all of a sudden, everything that they believed is now being pressured on. And they begin to have to quickly relook at their faith. And so, deconstructing sometimes isn't so much about growing out of faith, it's growing into your own faith, not your parents' faith, or not what your, well, that's just what my pastor told me. And so, it actually is a very helpful exercise. But it's very tricky, because sometimes in the deconstructing phase, we can't have the right people to guide us along, and we go into a state of increasingly discouragement, even disillusionment, even disbelief. Disbelief is that unwillingness to believe. And if we're not careful, that can even take us all the way to not just an unwillingness, an actual rejection of maybe what we once held true, call that deconversion. And so we have, a, we have some examples of that today, of, of people looking at their faith and realizing and rejecting it all. That's a very serious thing. So doubt is not trivial, but it doesn't need to be terminal because deconstructing is helpful only in the way that it helps us to reconstruct a more solid, holistic belief system that then helps us grow until the next event. Now, I would encourage you, don't wait for the event. I would really do encourage you that. I remember 2007, the event for me was my dad got very ill very quickly. We thought it was a brain tumor. It turned out to be an abscess on his brain. But it was for 24 hours, I thought I was going to lose my dad. Dad's a Christian, who loves God, is very involved in his church. I was a pastor at that time. You'd think I'd have suffering down. I think I'd preach sermons on suffering. But it's a little different when it comes to home, right? It's a little different when it's out there and it's all up here. But when it's like you're looking at someone you dearly love suffering. And so the questions came to me. The doubts, like, God, I know, you're, I know you're good, and I know you're sovereign, and I know you heal, but now I'm uncertain about the situation. And through that process, it helped me come to a place of being able to reconcile those things. Not verses, not faith or suffering, not God's goodness or God's weak. It, it's, it's, it, helps, it helped me reconstruct a more robust faith that hopefully showed more empathy to people who were struggling with that question, but also perhaps to help them through that and say, I've been on that journey with you. And so I, I exhort you, don't wait for the event. You might not have questions about faith, but look around the culture. What do your friends struggle with? Almost undoubtedly, oh, it's the question of evil, suffering. Oh, the church hates homosexuals. Oh, the church, you believe that God's going to send people to an eternity of torment? Do you believe that? Figure it out. Go deconstruct and then reconstruct your faith to help them and figure that out. And so 
So hopefully that, that helps you. It doesn't have to end in a, in, a, in a bad way. It really doesn't. And so oftentimes, we just kind of believe things, and maybe it, and it often happens with people who've grown up in faith, who've grown up in the church, and it's just they've never really had a question for themselves, but then something hits them, some change of life, a stage of life, or crisis begins to force them to question, and they haven't really. Or perhaps we've created environments where people have had doubts, but they suppress them. They suppress them enough, and then all of a sudden, it just comes up. And so we want to avoid that, and we're going to look at some applications, how we can do that at the end. So all this talk of doubt, is, are you saying that we can not be certain about anything? Doubt and certainty. Is certainty wrong? Is it wrong to have an absolute certainty about it? And no, it's not. In fact, it's very healthy for us to have some certainty in our lives, especially in a world that's very, we asked to question everything. In a world, it's reassuring to have some certainty. So it's not the question of abandoning certainty, but it is all about making sure we place our certainty in the right place. That's the key. For example, we should be certain that God is the author and creator of life. We should have confidence in that. But perhaps be a bit tentative eggs to be totally certain about how exactly he got creation going. We did a series in Genesis this year. And there are very well-respected godly men and godly women who have very different ideas and ways to interpret Genesis 1 and 2. And so sometimes, in some places, I remember, like, I, I don't think this is intentional, and I don't, my parents didn't teach, but I grew up, and it was like, oh, the, year, the earth is 6,000 years old, dinosaurs didn't exist, so I don't know how we explain all dinosaurs, and that kind of thing, and it's like, all of a sudden, I had to go on my journey, like, hang on, is that actually true? Is it totally incompatible to actually believe that the, that the, the universe could actually be 13.8 billion years old? Does that contradict God? Could God not be sovereign over that? And so, in those regards, my deconstructions help been very healthy. And so there are certain things we can be absolutely certain about. We can be certain that God is accomplishing His will in the earth. Maybe a little less certain about how exactly He's going about that. We can be certain that God is love, a little less certain about what that love looks like, because we have an idea of what love is. If you love me, you would act like this. But sometimes we can't presuppose and assume that on God, right? If he is the very essence of love, surely he gets to define what love looks like and what it doesn't look like. Does that make sense? That yes, there are certainties about our faith. Uh, after this series, we're going to do a whole series on the creed. Those are some certainties that the church, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, have been able to agree on for two millennia. That's important. Some certainties about our faith that we can absolutely hold on to. That we don't need to waver. We can hold on to the fact that Jesus is both divine and human. Not quite sure how that all works out. That's okay. The challenge and the problem is when we are think that we are certain about everything. My understanding of the Bible, my understanding of Christian, that I'm certain about it. It's the right view and interpretation. There's a word for that. Fundamentalism. And that's the problem. That's the problem for a lot of young people when they've been grown up in a church or an environment where it's been fundamentalism. And they've been absolutely certain this is how God creates. Absolute certain about this is what God does and doesn't want you to do. Absolute certainty. And all of a sudden, when they get pushed back to that, it's actually, actually no. The church has had different views on that. They don't only really throw that out, they throw the whole thing out. Well, if I can't trust God, if I can't believe that, if, if you're saying that the six days of creation couldn't, is not literally 24 six days, 24 hour periods of six days, well, how can I believe anything in the Bible? So I throw everything out. And that's a normal reaction to that, but it's an unnecessary one. It really is an unnecessary one. We need to help people think better uh, about their doubts. So certainty, yes. But it's not that we're chasing after certainty. Certainty can be an idol. We can want certainty to a point where it becomes an idol. And Jesus didn't promise us certainty. Back to the Yancey quote, there has to be an element of faith. Otherwise, if everything was certain about it, there's no need for faith. There's no need for trust. There's no need to trust God in the gap of where my knowledge and His knowledge, my understanding finishes and His ways are higher than that. That certainty is not there. And so there is where the trust, there is where the belief comes in. There's a great uh, quote uh, that talks about this. It says, in, in essentials, unity, in the core things of our faith, 
unity. In non-essentials, how does God create? When is Jesus actually going to come back? Liberty. In other words, have some liberty about some different views on that. And then in all things, charity. In all things, charity. And so I think that's a great way to navigate sometimes when we have different ways of, of viewing things. All right, if you're still with me, let's look at some practical ways how we can redeem doubt. If you're a believer here, I know many of you are believers, many of you are Christians, which is fantastic. Uh, hopefully you're certain about that. Well, tongue and cheek. And there's, there's a certainty that should come about in your salvation as well. But just know what, what you base that certainty on. Is it, is it because you acted well this week? Or is it because Jesus acted well through his whole life? I'm banking on his record, not my record. So there's those things that you just need to make sure your certainty is in the right spots. First thing as believers, I think we need to acknowledge and wrestle with doubts. Some of you have major doubts in your Christianity today. Maybe you're fearful to express that in your small group or to a friend. Why? I don't know why you might be fearful for that, but maybe you feel like you're going to be told you shouldn't have those doubts. And I want to tell you, right, it's okay to acknowledge and wrestle with your doubts. Secondly, um, we shouldn't be afraid to ask sincere questions. You know the problem when you suppress doubts? They usually, typically, resurface in a much more toxic form. And I think we're seeing that with some of these leaders. And the advent of social media is not helping. Because instead of having these conversations with a private group of people, we're not having these conversations with 20,000 followers on Instagram. And, uh, and, and that's not, I don't think, a very good way to, to wrestle with your doubts, okay, to wrestle with your challenges. So don't be afraid to ask sincere questions. Let's go back to our friend Thomas. Is anyone warming up to Thomas here? You know that we call him Doubting Thomas, but why don't we call Peter hypocritical Peter or denying Peter? You know, he's the great apostle. You know, Thomas, tr church tradition goes on to tell us that after the encounter with Jesus, he was sold in that. He makes the first public confession after the resurrection, my God and my Lord. He goes on to be apostle, church tradition tells us, to, be, to India. And he goes to evangelize India, and he stays there, and he's a martyr, and he dies for his faith there. So let's give the guy a break. <laughs> there is another instance which, where Thomas is recognized in, in the Gospel of John. Very few instances of John. This is the other one. And look at the question he asks. He's, Jesus is telling his disciples, hey, take heart. Don't be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to my Father. He begins to prepare them for what he's about to do. He says, don't worry, I'm going to come back. Where I'm going, you know the way, where I'm going. Thomas pipes up and says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. He's uncertain, right? He's expressing some doubt. How can we know the way? Aren't you glad Thomas asked that question? Because in response, what we get, Jesus says something in John chapter 14, verse 6. He says, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Are you not glad that Thomas asked that question? That he didn't shrink back and think, what is Peter going to say? He always knows everything. <laughs> Aren't you glad that in his small group he expressed a question and that we got the benefit of hearing Jesus say something that you can be certain about? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Sincere questions can bring incredibly new insights and breakthroughs. Don't be afraid to voice sincere questions. Maybe you're here today, you're not a believer yet. Maybe you're skeptical, or maybe you're a seeker, maybe you're genuinely trying to figure this out. My encouragement would be for you is if we're asking believers to understand the reasons behind their faith, that you understand the faith behind your reasoning. Any, any doubt or skepticism is really just another set of alternative beliefs, and that's okay. And so the only thing is to question the faith behind some of those alternative doubts and beliefs. You say, there truly can't be just one religion. Well, we can't prove that empirically. And that's not a universal truth. And so, you need to doubt your doubts in some ways if you're a skeptical, uh, a skeptic. But as a church community, um, I think what we want to do is we want to build a healthy church culture where we, uh, we're gracious to people that struggle with doubts from time to time in their faith. Um, John chapter 20, verse 26, it says, Eight days later, Jesus' disciples were inside again. And who's with them? Thomas was with them. In other words, the disciples didn't turn around and say, Thomas, you're a hypocrite. You're an unbeliever. You're a heathen. You're no longer invited to our small group. 
go to the place down the road. No, he's hanging out with them. And credit to Thomas, he hasn't withdrawn from community, which is often what happens when we struggle. The first thing we do is we step away from relationship. What is he doing? He's still leaning in. He's leaning into community. He's leaning into relationship. He doesn't believe what they believe at that moment, but they're still including him. And aren't they glad to include him? Because who shows up? Jesus! It makes all the difference. Jude one twenty two says, Have mercy on those who doubt. If you're struggling, stay in community. Everything in you tells you to run away. Let me just step back, figure things out myself. And in this hyper-individualized culture, that's just disastrous. Stay in community, lean into community. And as community, we need to make space for people who struggle. Make space to, in our small groups, in our different conversations, to allow people to express doubts. But not let them wallow and stay there. Let's lead them to places. There's some really brilliant minds, much smarter than mine, much smarter than our collective, who thought long and hard about these questions. We thought long and hard about these questions from a biblical point of view. We can help uh, with those kind of things. Let's cultivate a healthy church culture. And then lastly, maybe just be pastorally, as I, like, when I look at these people, and Marty Sampson and Joshua Harris, the first thing that rises in me is just a deep compassion. I, I think they're coming out of potentially unhealthy environments where they weren't allowed to bring questions. When I look at some of the things that they're complaining about, and they're saying the church never talks about these, and with all due respect, the church has been talking about these things for a long time. It's just your pocket of the church world maybe wasn't. But for 2,000 years, the church has been wrestling with these. You don't, don't be so proud to think no one's ever been asking these questions. There's a richness in our church body across different traditions, across the generations. And so let's not be proud to say no one's talking about these things. The church has wrestled with eternal hell and torment for ages. There are very different views on that. The church has wrestled with the sovereignty of God and, and yet the evil and suffering you see on this world. Some brilliant minds have gone way before you in that. But here's my pastoral appeal to us is don't lose the faith by losing the focus. You know, sometimes Jesus does deserve a better representation of Christianity. Let's acknowledge that. Sometimes Jesus does deserve a better, better representation. Sometimes part of Christianity doesn't represent him well. And unfortunately, they're in our tribe. It's like it's like part of your family is like their family, but gosh, they're embarrassing. And sometimes we feel like that. Sometimes we look around our tribe our Christi and how Christianity is portrayed in the media and like, oh, I don't think that really exemplifies Jesus, but we're still trying. But I want to read uh, the last two ver three verses that John goes on. He goes on to say this after this encounter. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe, so that you may be certain that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Don't lose the faith by losing the focus. The focus comes back to the person of Jesus Christ. If you're doubting aspects of faith, go back, deconstruct back to that. What do you believe about Jesus? Because historically He walked this earth. And he said some pretty radical things that either he was a lunatic, either he was a liar, or he really was who he was. And then you build upon them and you believe that he was risen from the dead three days later because that changes everything. If he didn't rise from the grave, none of this matters. None of it. None of it matters. Who cares if God authored the world or not? But if he did rise from the grave, everything matters upon that. And I encourage you to be certain and build your life on that revelation and go from there. John says this. This is all so that you believe in Jesus. Don't lose the focus. Bring it back to Him. Bring it back to Jesus. Let's pray with that in mind today. And God, we are so thankful that You are gracious. Uh, you are merciful, Jesus. Even Your interaction with one of Your very own who refused to believe. Um, but you were strong with him, you, you rebuked him, but you were gracious. You also gave him evidence that, that solidified and helped him take the step of faith that he would need to. God, many of us, Lord, we're like Thomas. We ask questions, we have questions. We doubt sometimes, we sometimes are unwilling to believe as well, Lord. But you're gracious with us and you're strong with us. And just like you returned the answer to to Thomas and say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But we either choose to believe that or we choose to reject that. But I thank you, God, that as we receive that and build our lives upon that, God, that we can have a certainty in our belief 
and our faith in you. God, there are many things in this world that are mysterious to us. God, many things in this world, as we look around, we, we don't understand. God, there are many things about you we don't understand that sometimes don't reconcile. And so I thank you that it's okay for us to voice that. Your scriptures are filled with men and women who voiced complaints and laments and questions. And God, you're so gracious with us. You're so good with us. And I pray that people who may have those questions today, would they know your goodness and your graciousness to them? But that, Lord, even in that, Lord, you do want us to be clear and certain about the important things. The revelation of who you are in your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray that we wouldn't lose faith by losing the focus and that Jesus had come back to you. So today, Lord, we worship you and we say you are the Son of God. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. We are anchoring our lives in that and we are building our lives upon that. And we are worshiping you because of that. Help us in this moment, in this city, in this nation. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.